Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, our briefing meeting uh, for the uh, Tuesday, the 30th of June 2020. Uh, that is uh, commencing. Beg your pardon? Sorry. Vince, Councillor Happerman. Sorry, I put this on your date. It's the 30th of June. That's correct, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, so we're starting at a good note for our briefing meeting. Uh, I welcome everybody both here and online uh, to the briefing meeting. As per uh, normal regulation, this meeting will be chaired uh, by the CEO uh, so that councillors have the opportunity through the CEO to ask questions of the general managers and, uh, and other uh, members of the staff through the CEO. So I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Councillor McLaughlin uh, is uh, online uh, and uh, available as is every other councillor here this morning. Over to you, Mr. CEO. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we'll start by going around the table and having any uh, conflicts or material personal interests declared uh, for next week's meeting. If you can do that, please. And if you can specify the item number and the general nature of that Yeah, Mr. Mayor, then CEO. Thank you. Councillor Barnes. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm just trying to find the um, uh, item number in relation to the application by um, Sockles. Is that L2? Uh, bear with me. L2. Yep. For, okay, item L2. Um, I just advise the, the meeting that I may have a, a conflict of interest that's yet to be determined, but uh, in the interest of uh, caution and transparency, I will be leaving this meeting for that. Um, also advise the meeting that because I'm feeling unwell, um, I'll be sitting at the back of the room and uh, taking part in the meeting from there with the uh, consent of the chair. Thank you, Councillor Barnes. Thank you. Councillor McLean. Um, I'd like to declare a conflict, uh, conflict of interest on item S1 for Councillor Barnes. Um, I'm a tourism in that two of my businesses are financial matters of Bundaberg Tourism. Thank you. Councillor Honor. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in relation to uh, items T10 and T11, uh, in regards to uh, development charges, and uh, I would like to uh, declare that uh, I have uh, a possible material uh, personal interest in those matters due to um, my um, development uh, approval not being completed, and uh, I wish to leave the room on those two matters. Thank you, Councillor Trevor. No. Yeah. Councillor Bartels. No, Mr. CEO. Councillor Lima. No. Councillor Mitchell. No, Mr. CEO. Councillor Cooper. No, Mr. CEO. Councillor Hatton. I'm just to declare I may have a perceived conflict of interest in item 01, as I'm a member of, a member of the Rotary Club of Bunbrook Sunrise, another Rotary Club that I pay and stay in the meeting. Just for clarity, not the one, not one of the clubs. Not one of the two Okay. No. And Councillor McLaughlin. Any conflicts, Tanya? Councillor Hatton. 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 Uh, we'll move on to the first item. Anthony, been waiting impatiently. Thank you. Financial Thank you. summary as of 29 May. 29 May. Good morning, Council. Um, the, the financial summary to the 29th of May uh, is presented there to show Council's progress against the budget. Um, just to uh, so go a couple of the highlights um, of the financial summary. Uh, as we're all aware, the, um, the fees and charges uh, will be impacted this year due to the ongoing pa pandemic. Um, Interest revenue will uh, also be slightly lower this year uh, than expected because of the um, reduced interest rates that uh, are being received at the moment. Uh, on the um, fees and charges in the water section, um, the recoverable works has uh, um, had increased a couple of works there, so we'll see some uh, increase in the revenue from in the water area. And also to note in the revenue is the sale of developed land. Um, there's $1.4 million there that we haven't budgeted for, and it's, it's, um, we typically don't budget for the sale of developed land unless it's actually um, you know, uh, highly likely that it will uh, proceed in that period of time. So, On the expenditure side, uh, employee costs, finance costs and depreciation um, are all on target, and we believe they'll be close to the, to the budget at the 30th of June. Uh, materials and services we believe will be slightly lower. Um, some of that, uh, once again, is 
because of when it works has been deferred for the pandemic and also some non-capital projects um, in there. A good point uh, I suppose to note is the financial assistance grants um, we budgeted to receive the first six monthly uh, payment for next year in, in this current year which that has come through and that was um, received around about $400,000 more than expected so uh, uh, which is good news for council. Um, just to um, at the capital expenditure we're running around about 66% at the end of May uh, there was a lot of work going on in June and we expected getting uh, a lot closer to the budget by the 30th of June um, in that space and uh, with, on the um, cash flow, uh, flow the, um, it's higher than expected I suppose once again because of that um, financial assistance grant but uh, in typically what happens in June is we, we call it the June effect um, because a lot of uh, projects are trying to be completed um, before the 30th of June and a lot of accounts to be uh, settled and uh, so we do expect a, a significant um, outflow of cash in the, in the last, last month of the year. Um, with the rates there, there's just an update there uh, that we're about a, a million dollars um, worse off than where we were this time last year, uh, mainly due to the pandemic and Council's decision not to actively recover uh, the debt. Uh, and that works out around about a 0.4 of a percent um, of, the, of, the, uh, of the rates that's in here. And also on the infringements, just an update on the infringements and the spur, the, um, uh, the finance team and the C&E team have been working closely together to uh, go through our recovery processes and how we manage uh, spur um, and we're getting towards the end of that so um, we believe we've got much better processes coming in place to, to manage our spur debt although the information is heavily dependent on, on spur itself. So. Um, but um, hopefully we're more on top of, uh, as you might be aware, we had significant write-offs in that spur area over previous years. Um, so just, I suppose, just the note going forward, in June, um, there is a, uh, uh, a number of variations we're expecting will come uh, mainly between the funds uh, that will have a bit of an impact. Um, there's um, uh, the accounting standards. Uh, we have to apply this new accounting standards, which we'll have to apply this year. Um, we're not expecting that to have a significant impact, but there will be some change. And also there's um, our accruals, uh, and they're hard to predict where the accruals are going to land. So, um, but at, at this stage, um, we're not expecting there to be a, a significant change to the um, budget that it sits there, but there will be some explanations uh, that we'll bring forward in, in June. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, questions or comments? Councillor, please. <laughs> I was just wondering if we had, because we're not um, enforcing the, the collection of the rates, did we expect that to be larger than the 0.4% we're behind last year, Anthony, or is that, did we have an expectation, I guess? I, I suppose, yeah, it was a difficult one to um, um, determine, uh, and, and so we didn't, yeah, we didn't really have an expectation, yeah. uh, it's just something that we had to monitor and keep on, on top of. Um, the team have been uh, still in contact with the uh, ratepayers without sending debts just to try and encourage them to, to uh, make um, monthly payments or, or periodic pay payments. Yep. Um, and that'll be our process we'll follow forward into the next uh, six months as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll just make a comment on that. I think even when the council's moratorium finishes on charging interest on overdue rates and we start actively uh, trying to recover those debts, I think there will, will be a, a lag time. So I would expect it will take a couple of years for us to return to the level of <coughs> outstanding debt that we've worked really hard to achieve yeah. in the last few years. Yeah. So I, I don't think that's going to turn around very quickly, even when we, we start actively trying to recover those <coughs> So just, but as I said, as Anthony said, it's, it's unknown territory. Mm. But just looking at the, the overall situation, I think it'll, it'll take some period of time. Um, any other questions for Anthony? Summary? No. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the policy. Well, <coughs> Good morning, councillors. Um, for adoption at next week's meeting, we're presenting the uh, second and last suite of the review of the council policies. Um, the policies have been reviewed by the policy authors and they will continue to be reviewed and monitored, um, either renewed uh, annually or biannually, depending on what's uh, best practice or if there's any changes in the law. 
um, one policy to note is the Moncrief Entertainment Centre Community Access Scheme policy. That's going to be rescinded and won't be amended or re-adopted um, because of the lack of applications that were received under that scheme. So um, for either um, for new adoptions, so with amendments that were made to those policies, we have the Alcohol and Drug Policy, version 2, Arts and Cultural Services Fundraising and Sponsorship Policy, version 2, Asset Management Policy, version 2, Burial and Private Property Policy, version 2, Cemetery Management Policy, version 2, uh, Commemorative Plaques and Memorial Policy, version 2, Community Grants Policy, version 2, Eat Safe Bundaberg Region Policy, version 2, Environmental Policy Version 2, Exhibits Policy Version 2, Internal Audit Policy Version 2, Record Keeping Policy Version 3 and Water Leak Relief Policy Version 2 and for endorsement, so there were no amendments made to these policies, we have the Community Housing Rent Policy, Competitive Neutrality Complaints Policy, Entertainment and Hospitality Policy, um, equal Employment Opportunity Policy, uh, Non-Current Asset Recognition Policy, Related Party Disclosures Policy and Traded Waste Policy for adoption. If anyone's got any questions? <coughs> so that, that now completes our full review of all policies? That's it. All the policies, council. all councillor um, adopted policies have all been reviewed in those two suites, so that's everything now. Unless there's any changes to best practice or law, um, it's not anticipated that they'll be back for another 12 or potentially two years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Water and Westwater, Stuart, has handed this one. Welcome, Stuart. Morning, councillors. Morning. 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 So this uh, report for the, the meeting next week deals with uh, fast track plumbing applications, which is a specific uh, creation of the plumbing drainage regulation uh, 2019. So in the past, we've offered fast track applications, but the uh, recently adopted fees and charges schedule doesn't include a fee for uh, fast track uh, applications from uh, for the uh, from this time onward. <coughs> Uh, the purpose of this report is to formalise that position of not offering fast track applications. The reason for that is that uh, we've done quite a bit of work with our team and brought down our averaging average application processing times to uh, four and a half days for determination. Uh, so there's no longer really a need for fast track applications. Um, so the recommendation for the meeting next week is that council resolves to opt out of fast track applications uh, in accord with the uh, the regulation. Thanks, Joe. Any questions, comments? Councillor McFady. I have a comment more than anything. I um, contacted a, a few um, of the businesses in this industry and they were all, most of, none of them really used the service and most of them, they all said they were very happy with the turnaround times of council, so that's good. That's good to hear. It's certainly, um, it's better than it has been uh, until recently and very few applications have been fast-tracked, it's about 1 in 30 and sometimes in the past we hadn't been able to turn around the fast-track applications within the time period, right. so although they were paying for a fast-track application, mm. they weren't getting a fast-track response. Yeah. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, then we move on to the development assessment. Uh, Richard, can you do this one? Good morning, councillors. Good morning, Richard. <coughs> uh, councillors, item L1 is a development application at uh, Morgan Way and Georgia Terrace uh, in Galpi. It's a material change of use application for rooming accommodation and short term accommodation. And it's uh, located under two allotments of land with a land area of 2.7 hectares and the land's currently vacant. Uh, the land's located in the low density residential zone of the planning scheme and the application was impact accessible. So went through a public notification uh, process where council received 42 property <coughs> submissions and 15 not property note submissions. Um, Proposal uh, comprises two components, as I said, um, student accommodation and workers' accommodation components. So the workers' accommodation is 26 two-bedroom 
um, units or dwellings with um, maximum of six persons in each dwelling. And the student accommodation has uh, 24 units uh, with three bedrooms and a maximum of six persons in each accommodation. Um, the development uh, includes a communal open space area with a barbecue shelter and facility and uh, on-site uh, car parking, um, a dedicated on-site parking area. Uh, the application was originally, it's been subject to two changes, but it was originally lodged with us back in February 2019 and um, yeah, it's been subsequently changed to um, the current proposal that you're um, uh, being asked to look at today. So um, overall there's 50 units and um, uh, a maximum of 300 persons within um, those units. And looking at the locality, this part of um, or this land area is represented as um, uh, stage three of one mile crossing the state, uh, with stages one and two already developed um, access by Georgia Terrace and Morgan Way, and currently approved mainly for um, low density residential uh, dwellings. The site's separated by uh, physically separated by a 25 metre drain um, and um, leaves it on a, a sort of excluded um, parcel and um, has a development history in that in uh, 2011 the site was approved by the Planning Environment Court for a 48 unit, um, sorry, 46 unit um, development and in more recently in 2016 it was approved for a 27 lot conventional residential uh, subdivision and uh, both those um, development approvals have now elapsed and we're considering this current proposal. Uh, as the report um, details, um, the density or the low density residential area is predominantly developed for low density residential purposes, but it doesn't preclude um, the development of multi dwelling uh, developments and it anticipates a maximum density of 25 equivalent dwellings per hectare. And this site, uh, with a land area of 2.21 hectares, um, could have a maximum development density of 55 equivalent dwellings, so it's marginally. Um, below the proposed development is marginally below the maximum density for this area. Um, when we look at multi residential uses, there's a um, equivalent dwelling, dwelling density that's applied um, within the planning scheme, uh, and uh, that's detailed within the body of the report there for the councillors to review. The current proposal um, uh, is, uh, has an equivalent density of 49.6 um, equivalent dwellings. Uh, per hectare, so again, marginally below at um, the maximum density of 50, uh, 50 dwellings. Uh, uh, sorry, 25 dwellings per hectare. The, um, the report details the supporting infrastructure that's um, developed um, in the locality and um, the site to be connected to basic um, urban services. <coughs> the and engineers have looked closely at the, um, uh, the road environment of Georgia Terrace and um, Morgan Way uh, and Georgia Terrace um, is considered to be a, uh, a link within our local planning area for the Kalki area there that will provide a connection uh, through to the adjoining rural land which at a time in the future will likely be developed for a residential purpose so um, it's intended that um, Georgia Terrace link be uh, dedicated not constructed but um, uh, to connect through to the um, adjoining area and provide that um, connection. Uh, in terms of car parking sites, uh, the development itself is proposed to um, provide 74 enclosed garage spaces and 51 uh, open visitor spaces and um, that overall results in a shortfall of 10 car spaces uh, as per uh, the council's planning scheme policy. In a development of this type, although there's a shortfall, there's still a fairly significant um, dedication of car parking and there's suggested to also be the use of a maxi taxi service that would provide some um, uh, transport opportunity um, coordinated by the um, operator and the planning report summarises that that um, shortfall, um, um, a discretion should be used to support that shortfall at this time. Um, there's a commentary about landscaping and uh, amenity uh, impacts within the report as well and a lengthy section as you'd expect with um, 42 pop, uh, properly made submissions regarding the public notification for the development so there's a, uh, a tabulated 
um, outlined there of the, uh, the matters that were raised by submissions and an office of response uh, accompanying it. But uh, if I might summarise quickly, the, um, uh, the range of um, concerns related to impacts on infrastructure, impacts on the amenity of the locality. Um, one theme that came out through the public submissions, some councillors might be aware, is that the uh, Morgan Way and uh, Georgia Terrace uh, estate has been um, developed uh, with a range of um, dual occupancies and uh, dwellings with secondary dwellings that are uh, alleged to be used for unlawful dual occupancies and um, uh, councils taking a separate uh, compliance um, uh, action against um, operators that have been identified as using those facilities uh, unlawfully but sensibly that um, concerns pervaded um, some of the thoughts of the residents in the locality that increased densities uh, albeit detached from the, um, the main part of one mile crossing uh, estate has compounded some of their concerns. So that was a feature through some of the submissions. Um, but any of the dual occupancies that exist in that locality that aren't subject to um, uh, the Council's current enforcement um, uh, action have been constructed um, lawfully and in accordance with the uh, relevant approvals of the planning scheme. Um, so that was a... Um, uh, a summary there for uh, councillors to, to review in terms of um, the items that were raised uh, through some of the submissions. Um, in consideration of uh, all those matters, um, the, the report concludes that um, despite being in the low density residential zone, that there's locality um, considerations in that location which make this um, site acceptable to be uh, recommended for approval and that we can impose conditions to deal with any of the amenity impacts or infrastructure impacts that um, uh, might be experienced in the uh, locality. And uh, the one of the um, ways that um, the Council's uh, office, assessment officers were uh, considering resolving uh, an amenity impact on the northern boundary of the site is that we are uh, requesting that there be a reduction uh, of uh, one duplex unit at the uh, northern boundary of the site, which would result in 12 uh, instead of 14 units along that northern boundary, resulting in the eight, uh, eight yards, three yards of the um, uh, properties in May, Makey Street um, to the north. Um, uh, having less densities at that property boundary, that interface will also be fenced and landscaped, um, and that'll take the overall um, number of units that would be approved through this development uh, to uh, 48 units, further reducing the, uh, the densities. Looking at the conditions um, that are recommended uh, here to accompany any uh, approval, Condition 4 requires that um, uh, amended plan to be submitted to Council with a reduction of uh, the units. Uh, there's also some uh, use specific conditions that require maximum occupancy of six um, uh, occupants uh, per unit. Uh, open space areas at condition 13 are required to not cause off site amenity impacts and only operate or um, well not operate between the hours of 10 pm to 6 am to further reduce off site impacts. There's a detailed landscaping um, requirement for submission uh, to the council. There's also um, a requirement to incorporate agricultural buffers because the land uh, to the north uh, east, uh, northwest is um, sort of um, being used for a cropping purpose. Um, there's uh, a requirement in the car parking conditions to also ensure that there's no on street car parking within um, Georgia Terrace or Morgan Way and that the um, the allocated number of car parks be provided to service the development, along with the uh, maxi taxi um, old minibus um, uh, type service, which is condition 39 of the approval. Uh, condition 40 requires the land dedication of Georgia Terrace to continue through to the lot to the north so that we may um, realise uh, into the future a uh, more connected urban, uh, urban development going forward. Um, Councillors, I'm uh, aware that in the information package that you received, there was a, uh, an infrastructure charge notice, and although councillors aren't um, are being requested to consider the infrastructure charge, there was an error uh, within that um, uh, charge that talked about a uh, in interest charge for late payments. So um, that uh, that template uh, will be modified before it's um, 
before any infrastructure charge uh, notice is sent out should the council decide to endorse this uh, uh, development proposal. Thanks, Richard. Uh, questions? Question. Richard, the access for vehicles is now only through Georgia Terrace, is it? Uh, <clears throat> through the chair, the actual there's no prohibition on Morgan Way being utilised for access purpose, but the primary access purpose is for is through Georgia Terrace and the car parking areas are connected uh, at that point. Um, so uh, the um, development engineers uh, are of the view that um, the ability for some cars to continue to <coughs> move through both <coughs> networks will make, mean that there's not a concentration of vehicles on the one roadway. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Oh, sorry, Councillor. Just a, a question there, Mr. Chairman, in regard to infrastructure charges. Do you uh, foresee that it will be lowered or increased, or what is the. <coughs> So through, through the chair, just the, the point that I was clarifying there that within the information package that the councillors were given, um, there was the inclusion on the infrastructure yes. charge of a late payment um, uh, interest uh, payment that was applicable. Uh, that's not consistent with the policy um, and the template that was identified was uh, in error. The council, councillors aren't being asked to consider that, but um, we're just clarifying that that would be um, resolved because the council did raise that, that that was uh, a concern of the notice, so I just wanted to clarify that. <coughs> it was a historic interest rate that was linked to the uh, same interest rate used to apply to the right. property rates, yep. which has subsequently been reduced by uh, regulation. So just check with the council. And we don't have any questions. Okay. No, no, I'm just checking if you have any questions. It can't be. Yeah, no, just we're still on the other one. Still on? Yeah, still on this one. Yeah, no, sorry. Um, okay, no other questions or comments, Mr. Oh, thank you, Richard. Uh, are you going to do that in the tavern as well? That's right. Thank you. No, sorry. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so uh, item L2 is material change of use application for a, a hotel, tavern use, and a shop and bottle shop at uh, 699 707 Bagara Road. It adjoins uh, what we know as the Stockwell's um, shopping centre complex there on the entry uh, to Bagara. The land's located in the district centre zone, a commercial designation essentially, and the level of assessment for this application was code accessible, uh, no public notification in this uh, case. Uh, as the Espagara Road is a uh, state controlled road, the application was um, referred to the Department of State Development, Manufacturing, Infrastructure and Planning um, uh, to consider state road safety matters as a referral agency. Uh, the tavern's got an 800 square metre um, gross floor area and includes a sports bar, bistro, gaming area, uh, kitchen and amenities use and a 200 uh, square metre covered outdoor beer garden facing Bagana Road. The bottle shop's a 400 square metre uh, building and includes a drive-through component. Um, the proposed hours of operation for the tavern are 9 a.m. Uh, to 1 a.m. and the bottle shop is from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, the siding of the development is in the unimproved frontage uh, adjoining the driveway to Bacara Road, which is currently characterised by a large stormwater tension base, and, and the development proposes to build over the top of that um, detention basin and um, is um, uh, yeah, peered over the top of that detention basin and is sited at this point about 16 metres from the um, front property boundary of. Um, this commercial site to Bacara Road, which caters for a um, proposed 10 metre uh, future road reserve uh, resumption foreshadowed by um, uh, main roads uh, if required. If the <coughs> road need, uh, ever needs to be widened, and that was ultimately, um, ultimately a six metre setback for this building. Um, the development proposes an additional 19 car spaces, taking the total 
car parking allocation for land to 403 uh, car parks on the site. Uh, as detailed in the report, there's uh, quite a bit of detail in there about the district centre zone um, code itself and what it's trying to encourage in terms of land use and building design um, and the uh, transport networks and, and infrastructure that connects to that uh, development. And um, the site's uh, obviously already developed or largely developed for a commercial purpose, so it's well connected with um, joining roadways and pedestrian connections. One of the important considerations that the report touches on is the environmental impacts of the development and predominantly that relates to um, uh, environmental impacts of uh, noise and uh, lighting uh, from the development, lighting in respect of um, impacts to uh, nesting sea turtles and the um, noise in terms of the operation of noise and the impacts on the uh, potential impacts on adjoining uh, residential uh, uses that are located on the opposite side of uh, Bagara Road and in general locality. So there's a commentary there relating to noise and lighting within um, the report, but the applicant did provide an environmental noise level impact assessment um, to support the development and um, it does require further um, reporting to be provided once the use is actually constructed and operational to ensure that it can meet its um, noise objectives. Uh, it's also required to broadly um, comply with the Environmental Protection Noise Policy um, uh, under the Environmental Protection Act and uh, the Office of um, Liquor and Gaming Regulation for the Liquor Licensing also has a close look at the um, noise impacts from these um, um, types of developments and including amplified music and, and the like. So, um, uh, they'll oh, take, take cancel's conditions package soon, but there'll be a requirement that uh, uh, noise management be closely uh, looked at through the development. And as was the case with a recent um, uh, similar type of development within the Bagara locality, we've also recommended that a patron um, management plan be incorporated into the proposal so that the uh, operator's got some responsibility to ensure that there's not congregation or noise impacts at closing time um, for those uses in car park areas and other uh, uh, parts external to the building. Um, on site parking at 403 parks uh, total for the site uh, equates to one space per 21 square metres of gross floor area for this development and so the parking allocation is considered to be adequate considering also that the peak use of um, uh, of this particular um, premises at times will be out of, um, out of step with um, the peak usage of the shopping centre use as well should, um, should allow for ample um, car parking. That's certainly what the traffic assessment is so detailed. In terms of condition, councillors um, will note that there's um, use of specific conditions. Condition 9 talks about the um, um, Patron uh, management plan for implementation. Conditions 10 and 11 deal with the operating hours that have been uh, requested. Uh, uh, there's a condition there, condition 14, relating to lighting and the um, dark sky compliant lighting to ensure that there's not um, uh, excessive light spillage from the uh, development. And conditions 16, 17, and 18 deal with um, noise requirements and um, the requirement to um, submit and have approved uh, the revised acoustic report uh, to recalculate noise impacts uh, once the sources of noise have been uh, accurately determined. So, recommended for approval subject to those conditions. Thanks, Richard. And I might just note that even though the decision making period finished yesterday, the applicant has agreed to an expansion of time. Yep, that's so correct. the council can make the decision at its general meeting next week. Uh, questions? Council Trevor. Richard, with regard to the lighting uh, clause, <coughs> will that lighting, as I understand, only relate to the new development, not doesn't change any conditions on the existing development? Through the chair, that's that's correct. So this um, this proposal can't uh, further regulate the lighting. Yep. Um, the broader shopping centre site that um, tries to balance the, the needs for um, lighting for public safety against the, uh, the lighting for um, uh, car parking areas and, and not causing undue um, off site lighting impacts. So, that, uh, part, part two, Mr. Chair, uh, so we can be assured that it won't add any extra 
spill from the side of, of lighting with regard to you know what we're trying to do at Pagara with uh, excessive lighting already existing in a number of quarters? Through, through the chair, um, there's, um, there's obviously going to be some additional lighting associated with this development that we've imposed our standard condition which uh, requires them to design and install external lights to be the most energy efficient dark sky compliant lighting that we can. So it's the, the balance between um, um, the, the new development and it's complying as closely as they can to those environmental criteria. Thanks, uh, any other questions? Uh, thanks, Richard. We'll just get it. Gavin, welcome to the tour. Good to see you. 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 As Council is aware, we had a presentation from the presidents of Bundaberg East and Bundaberg West Rotary Clubs. Uh, their intention is to amalgamate effective from 1 July and become Bundaberg Central Rotary Club. Um, Bundaberg East have an existing contract with Council for a, a, um, a deed of agreement um, to conduct the annual book fair. Um, the way the book fair works is that Council's library uh, gradually uh, each year goes through and deaccession as part of our collection. Um, old books uh, that are no longer being borrowed um, or those books that are surplus to what we've got um, and effectively provide those to Bundaberg East who then store them and then every year conduct an annual book sale. Uh, the proceeds of that sale are split at the moment, presently 50-50, uh, between Council and Bundaberg East. Uh, they use them for charitable purposes. Um, council uses them, the library uses them to purchase additional resources uh, that they then uh, make available to the public and borrowers. Um, Bundaberg East and Bundaberg West indicated, as we said, that they wish to amalgamate uh, to form a new um, Rotary Club. Uh, so effectively the existing uh, arrangement would have to be amended. Um, additionally, they've also said that under the current situation with COVID and the like, they've struggled to um, get funding and, and raise money and have asked if Council would reconsider the current revenue split, the 50-50 split, uh, with view to providing a uh, more favourable um, return to them. So um, the recommendation in the report here is that <coughs> we agree to, um, the Council agree or consider to agree to a 60-40 split with the 60% in favour of Bundaberg Central Rotary Club and that um, based on advice from our Chief Legal Officer, uh, we would have to enter in a deed, to ass a deed of assignment, which is to reflect the change in um, name of the Rotary Club from Bundaberg East to the new Bundaberg Central Rotary Club, and also approve the councils of the mind uh, to increasing the revenue split from 50-50 to 60-40 in their favour. Um, the current deed um, was entered into in 2017 for a five year period expires in 2022. Have you taken any questions? Um, I just got maybe some comments and um, questions regarding this. Um, the mayor mentioned um, the other week that there's many places where this runs very successfully in many towns, and I'm just wondering whether we are able to maybe offer some help to increase marketing around this. Um, it only if it hasn't been marketed at all, it's very easy to get the extra 20% in sales, which is going to give them their. $1,200 as well as council and going forward if the event grows I just sort of feel like obviously changing this 60-40 split is the easy thing to do um, because we can just sign a new document that's done but I'm just wondering if there's opportunity where we can help the Rotary Club um, as far as marketing using our Bundaberg now um, using Facebook if we were to do some social media advertising that's only going to be a few hundred dollars and I think um, the outcome going forward will be a lot more advantageous for both parties. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask is they have mentioned that it's, uh, excuse me, simply because of COVID this year. So would this 60-40 arrangement just be for this financial year or would it be going forward even when there wasn't the impacts of COVID? Um, and I think, I think that's all I wanted to ask. So just, just some thought around the table, that was all. Sure. Um, through you, Mr Chair, the, the intention is to amend the remaining period of the deed, so until 2022, so it will be continue on at that 60-40 split if the Council was of a view to wanting to do that. 
Um, they mentioned COVID as one issue, but also said the cost um, and amount of labour that they require um, to put the book sale together um, is meaning that it's, it's you know, cutting into and they see that it's a significant load at the moment, which is why they're after additional money. So COVID being one of the reasons. In regards to marketing, in the existing deed, there's already um, a commitment from council that we would support them in marketing. So we put it on our web page uh, previously, on our website previously, and certainly we can put it on Bundy now and others when it comes up. So there's already a commitment in existing deed that we would try to promote it as best we could through our existing channels to support them. So, yeah. Just one more question. Do we charge um, them rent for the facility when they run the... Uh, we share the cost usually depending on where they do it. So, and yeah. the shed that they store the books, they also, so council shed that they get at a greatly reduced price. Yeah. So, for the actual event, do they normally run it in one of like here at the centre? They have, they've run at the cultural centre before Pagara, yeah. and depending on the availability and when so they're proposing to have it. So. If we were to waive that rent cost, how much saving would that be for the club? Uh, I have to take it on notice, council, for you. Because there's usually some set up days and then the event itself and then. Um, pack down days, so we, I'd have to go and check based on how long they've hired previously. Um, any other questions? No, just by way of comment, is the recommendation before us is particularly in relation to the brief that's been presented <coughs> today for a 60 40 split on the other matters dealing with the service clubs, uh, are part of normal operations, <coughs> media and marketing, and promotion of events, hall hires. Um, other fees and charges that uh, we reduce in relation to community or other service clubs across the board. And uh, I just want to reassure everyone here at the briefing meeting and uh, those online uh, that all those matters are taken into account when we go through those matters individually, uh, not per the recommendations which are just before us here today. So they certainly get discussed and. Uh, Whatever we can do to help our associations, uh, we certainly will. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, all right, Gavin, still yes. new yes. development strategy. Oh, two, yes, new development strategy 2020 2023. Uh, Councillors, be aware that you recently received a presentation from um, our community development officer, Bev Devlin, um, and Kirsten Harrison, the manager of community services, in regards to um, updating what was previously called our social development action plan, which expired in 2017. Uh, we engaged a consultant, Sparrowly Group. Uh, to do the work on our behalf in regards to community engagement, um, working with all of the networks that we currently have in place uh, to determine what the local need is so that we can put together the community development strategy. An extremely important document for our community given the high level of um, social disadvantage that we suffer um, and council plays a key role in not only delivering services to that particular market but also um, facilitating in a lot of cases and networking with various groups to ensure that we provide services to all those who need them. Uh, so the Community Development Action Plan um, comes out of that. Uh, so there's a number of items in the Community Development Strategy <coughs> that identify specific actions where Council might be the provider, the facilitator, um, provide a network um, and to identify all of those things that we found as a result of this work. Um, and I commend the report to you. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, okay, thank you, Gavin. Next one. Uh, yeah, we'll move on to the Yep. Uh, Council, so it's a sole supplier arrangement with Surf Life Southern Queensland. Um, so this is, um, councillors be aware of the fact that um, there was a review undertaken by Surf Life Saving Queensland for all of the uh, service provision they do um, throughout Queensland for local councils where they patrol beaches um, in certain areas, uh, five beaches in our particular region. Um, we have entered previously contracts for provision of those services with Surf Life Saving Queensland. Um, they are effectively a sole supplier for this particular um, service. Uh, there is uh, uh, lifeguards Australia, which predominantly provide services in regards to pool safety, uh, not so much beach safety, but Surf Life Saving Queensland is providing specific service. Uh, given the fact that we are a tourist area, um, it's, this is about uh, protection of um, bathers uh, on our particular beaches. Uh, the proposal here is to enter into an agreement uh, for three years, um, from June 2020 to June 2023, um, at an annual cost of $443,405.34, excluding GST per annum. 
um, and that provides um, those services, particularly during the summer peak period and school holiday periods. Um, the reason this has had to come to council specifically is one, the value of the contract, and two, as they are a sole supplier, we're required under the Local Government Act um, to get council to resolve. So happy to take any questions if there are any. Just through you, Mr Chair, just uh, as per brief, uh, question to you, Gavin, is how long have we uh, uh, been supporting uh, the Surf Life Saving Association here locally? Uh, 32 years the service has been operating. 32 years. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, Mr. Chair. No questions? Thank you. 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 Uh, next item is S1, Bundaberg Regional Council and Bundaberg Tourism Partnership Agreement. Um, so as Council are aware, um, we provide uh, financial assistance to Bundaberg Tourism to deliver destination marketing on our behalf. Um, so that's obviously attracting tourists from outside our region to the beautiful Bundaberg region. Um, we have uh, done that um, on a contractual basis uh, with Bund what formerly Bundaberg North Bennett Tourism and, and more recently Bundaberg Tourism as a result of their name change. Um, the value of that is $550,000 per annum plus $50,000 in uh, effectively what we call project specific funding. So that's where Bundaberg Tourism, if an opportunity arose, come and present to Council um, to seek um, part or all of that $50,000 for a specific project. Um, the intention is to enter into an agreement with Bundaberg Tourism to continue that service. The current agreement expires this month, um, and so we're looking into in entering into a new four year contract with them, uh, which would kick off effectively from the 1st of July. So happy to take any questions if there are. Uh, just a clarification, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, whilst Council supports um, Bundaberg Tourism Limited with a substantial amount of money, um, is there still a corporate responsibility as well to um, support their uh, tourist information um, centres uh, to promote individual uh, tourism ventures? Um, just to clarify that, please. A little unclear on the question. So they run the tourism information centres on our behalf? That's right. Yeah. But uh, promotion of individual tourist initiatives uh, still require um, uh, extra support to um, tourism, uh, Bundaberg Tourism Limited, if they wish to. Uh, it's not all about um, council uh, helping out totally with the promotion, is that correct? Oh. They're, they're a member-based organisation, so they will um, provide services to members. So first and foremost, that's the way they're set up. Uh, council provides them funding specifically for the destination marketing and the operation of the visitor information centres at Childers, Jin Jin and Bundaberg. Um, they also seek funding from Tourism Events Queensland that they get um, to support destination marketing, particularly the Bundaberg region and the services of the year. So they promote the businesses that are members. Yep. Um, they promote the region as a destination through our destination marketing, which is the agreement we have with them, and then obviously operate the tourism information services through the visitor information centre. So, does that answer the question? I ask that question simply, uh, Mr Mayor and uh, Mr Chairman, because I think there is some uh, private operators that believe they probably should get more uh, for their um, investment through their council expenditure, but it's really up to them to support their all their um, member organisation as well, the best they can to give them individual support. This is an umbrella type support for tourism across our region. I, I guess the first question he has, Warren, would be to ensure that their members of the organisation are yes. actively yeah. um, supporting their own business. <coughs> That's what I'm getting at, uh, Mr Chairman. Uh, thanks, Gavin. Any other questions? Yeah, just uh, through you, Mr Chair, to, to Gavin. He's, uh, Whilst at the brief certainly outlines a contribution by the uh, Bundaberg Regional Council uh, of the over 500,000, while we, uh, in interest, the confidentiality and uh, obviously the agreements that we have with our uh, tourism operators here locally in the state government, without identifying the numbers, but uh, it would be fair to say that uh, the amount that the uh, local government contributes is substantially more than what the state delivers to the agreement. Would that be right? We are the primary funders, yes, Mr Mayor. That's right. Thanks. And I don't want you to outline 
the amounts the state that we are certainly a large and contributor in this instance and have been over the years. Thank you. Like many things, Mr. Mayor. Correct. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Gavin? No. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, you're going to do the next one, confidential. Yes, sir. Close meeting now to move into uh, consideration.